One over there. Yes, please. Yeah, the thing that interests me is that we want to protect these reefs and we want to do all these wonderful things, but we want to do them for tourism. Now, to get tourists there, we have to fly planes across the world, etc., etc., which leads to the problem. So really what we want to do is feather our own nest at the expense of everyone else's nest, which is the way the world runs, and it's a disaster. <laughs> Who's going to volunteer to ask him? <laughs> I've been volunteered, I think. Well done, David. You're absolutely right. We have to be very careful about flying and the impact it has in terms of uh, carbon dioxide production. But the other thing is, in terms of this, there are important messages to get to people who depend on reefs not just for tourism but for food. Now, we're in a lucky position in that we can rely on tourism for being one of the most important factors. But for a lot of people around the world, they rely on uh, reefs for food. And the thing is, they are destroying their future. The, the message in terms of protecting these herbivores is an important thing to do. What's happening around the world is some places, their reefs, when something goes wrong, they flip to algae. Others, it doesn't. And the reason is that they've removed the wrong species. So by protecting ours, we can set an example and hopefully give them a message whereby if they are going to do fishing on reefs, they do so with the knowledge of what the impacts will be. So it isn't entirely self-centered, but I do accept your point. Yes. And could I actually say that there's a report in The Economist two months ago, a supplement on the future of aviation, which is so inefficient, they could cut the emissions by 50% just by doing straightforward things like air traffic control reform. It's quite remarkable what could be done, let alone the uh, absence of trains in Australia. Why we have to fly from Sydney to Melbourne and, and places like that uh, instead of t taking trains. You know you can even have a train going from Paris to London in two hours now? Under the water? Next question. Question up here. Yes, please. Well, just to make a good point, Kilmany Island is shaped like a fish. Indeed it is. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I must, I can assure you that that's just a coincidence, as was the study of Nemo. <laughs> yes, please, here. A uh, question for Janice. Um, has there been any modelling uh, done or expectation that as oceans warm that there'll be um, reefs or um, uh, coral reefs forming in further south or as, as oceans warm so would, which are currently too cool for for reef development? There has been considerable speculation in some quarters that our coral reefs are going to move down to Sydney which will be great. Uh, unfortunately if you start to look at things the ocean acidification story has a spatial pattern to it, which means that coral reefs can't, are going to be less able to grow at those more southerly or polewood latitudes. You also have to factor in the bathymetry. You've got to have a suitable substrate where these corals can actually develop. And a lot of the reef areas now, it just sort of drops off and then you're gone. And also, people have looked at them. The minimum temperature for coral reef growth is about 17 degrees centigrade. Below that, you don't have reef-forming corals. If you look at the expansion of that area into areas where it's suitable for coral reef growth in terms of the substrate into the future, it's a very, very small increase in area. So it seems highly unlikely that that's going to, be going to happen. Certainly not in the short term. No. Yes, please. I just want to say to you scientists, for heaven's sake, pour it on. This is so impressive. My wife and I have just returned, as obvious from our suntans, three weeks sea kayaking on the wet Sundays in the wilderness, which we've done for five years. And the growth up there, the commercial growth, is alarming, absolutely alarming. And we've taken upon ourselves now to report breaches of regulations. And this is a pure coincidence. I was on the phone to Damien Head, who's the head investigative ranger in the wet Sundays, for two hours this afternoon, he phoned me about a couple of the complaints I made. Bob Pessy, is he in the room? His talk tomorrow is absolutely vital. Science and politics. 
And the navel gazing, which is a derogatory way of talking about what you're doing, I hope you are so politically active because this is the problem with Damien and the other people out there attempting to put in action the things that you say need to be done. There's a big gap between science and politics, as I think you know. Thank you. Any political comment on the panel? <laughs> Ove, do you want to? <laughs> <coughs> yes, no? Ove, come on. A couple of sentences. All right. Well, I, I, th I think it really is important, but I think that um, th th there's a communication issue that, that is really hard to, to, to get across, because scientists are, are really have to focus on small details. And then, of course to cross cultures there to then, you know, be like a politician, I suppose, it becomes really difficult. And I think often, um, and it's really quite humorous when you see scientists kind of uh, communicate to politicians, they'll tend to write this really long, lengthy report, and really politicians and people that are trying to frame policy really want the punchline. And I think um, we've got to do more to make science... Um, uh, reachable, if, if you like, for, if by these people. And I think that's really, that's the problem. There's a lot of keenness. I think everybody in the room would be really keen to have, make science have traction. It's just that we need to know how, you know. And that's a big stumbling block. Now, why did you pick me? <laughs> can't imagine. Oh, I've got one. Um, I, like to, I like to make a comment. Try this one. Oh. Um, I was actually going to say something very similar, not with the policy makers, but how to make this relevant to local communities on the ground in developing countries. And I just love everything you're talking, it's just fantastic, but how do we explain to a local villager with a primary school education these issues? Um, some of them make complete sense, like the stuff that Gary's talking about, you close an area, you get more fish, they get that. The stuff about the larval transport, that's a hard one to explain. And David, I think I want to ask you this question. How do you take these, these ideas that are fantastic and make them relevant and understood and accepted by communities on the ground who are the people who are going to be doing the conservation in many of these countries? How do you explain this rather complex thing about phase shifts and something that people have never seen? I think the, the answer is that these days, uh, well, in small villages, it can be very hard so that they may not have seen the damage. It's a case of they can't conceptualize how bad things can be. We're lucky in that we can go around the world and we can compare systems. But having said that, I find that people in developing countries are often a lot more aware of what's happening than we give them credit for. And I think it's just a case of giving them the tools and giving them the support and justifications. I was in the Philippines doing similar things to this about ooh, almost 20 years ago, and I was talking to someone there, and I was in the house on top and beneath were the pigs underneath, and I needed a translator. But effectively what he did is he told me all about the ecology of the reefs, how they were chopping down the rainforest, how there was increased water flow uh, and sediments, and it was destroying the, the, the rivers and the reef that he was working on. So he knew more than I knew about reefs. Everything was in place, but they just didn't have the power. Mm. So I think the secret is, in some ways, is to enable these people to have the support of the scientists and for the scientists and the locals to get together with the people who are on site trying to help them to make it politically effective within their countries. And, and that's a, a key step, I think. Yeah, if I could add just to, to Alison's comment, I, when I wear another hat, I've, I've been working in the Philippines for the last 25 years on coral reefs, and my uh, colleague of 25 years um, started working on those reefs in 34 years ago. And their, their, their um, experience with dealing with, with local communities was uh, going to those local communities and sitting down with them, showing slides of life cycles of, of corals, of life cycles of fish, starting with really basic sort of things and then asking them for their feedback. And David is absolutely right. They are a lot more switched on about the, the, the reef and the condition of the reef than you would ever imagine. Why? Because their lives depend on it in many situations and their, and their families and the, the kids to feed, feed rely on those resources out there. Um, the experience we've had in that country over the last 33 years now has been an incredible um, 
uh, development of community-based protection, building it from the ground up uh, so that, so that uh, uh, you go into a community, you put social scientists in there, you start to talk about life cycles and all of a sudden you start to talk about what are the problems. We're really worried about whether we're going to have uh, kids for our, our, uh, our kids are going to have uh, fish to, to eat our grandchildren. What do you think you can do about it? We're not quite sure what we can do about it. How about thinking about uh, lo local uh, government actions instead of everything controlled from the big cities, what about devolving some of those decision-making powers down to your village? Can we do that? In the Philippines, that's exactly what they've done in the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. So they've actually, actually brought it down to the village level and started to involve people in the management of coral reefs at the beach. I'll come to you, Ove. Um, you, you've seen my tie. It's got um, seahorses all over it. It was given to me by the seahorse lady, Amanda Vincent, who's doing the work in the village in the Philippines. What it requires for marine scientists to do is A, learn a foreign language, B, go to the village and sit down and listen. And then when you've understood their plight, why they catch seahorses and how they won't be able to buy dinner unless they sell them. And then tell them about how you can somehow keep the pregnant seahorses, which happen to be often to be male, <laughs> little details like that, and how they may keep pairs and nurture them in a closed off area where they can't escape but the offspring can. And so you can harvest at the same time as having a population grow. And next thing you know that you've been raided by the, the next village, which is then taught by your village the biology of what they've done. <laughs> and so, theoretically anyway, the seahorse lady gets things moving. Ove, you wanted to say something there? Yeah, I, just, uh, I was just really following on from what Gary had just said. And I was, this idea of local ownership of resources seems to be a recurrent theme, you know, not having centralised control. But, of course, the world is becoming globalised. Will, will you make some comments about what globalisation means for reef conservation? And perhaps this should be extended to the rest of the panel, given that sharks are very much uh, under threat from that, that exact uh, phenomenon. <laughs> Looks sideways and it was me. Um... It's, yeah, the, the, the devolution of, of responsibility, sorry, um, it, it, it's, it's actually co-management, so it, it's, it's a, the laws are such that the national government and the, the local municipalities uh, manage out to 15 kilometres off the coast of the Philippines, for example. So there is some, some bigger scale input into that decision making, of, of course. Go, I think what you're saying is go, go global and, and global markets and so forth. Um, that's a difficult one uh, from a silly fish biologist like me. Um, but having said that, if you don't get the local people involved in it somehow, I really doubt whether you're going to get some real ownership and some real progress. It's got to be done from both ends, it, um, I guess. Is the, I guess what I'm mm. getting at is uh, if you have the best local control of, of something and then the demand for live fish trade in, the, um, in Hong Kong or Singapore go to the markets there and you see most of the, the fish of Southeast Asia are in those markets. And you start to wonder whether it's, it's possible through those mechanisms of local control <coughs> to face off against that, you know, especially with impoverished people. How, how can you address that? I mean, you can go to the source, you know, mm. what do you do? In the, in the Philippines, 25 years ago, big commercial fishing operations were raging all over the country. They were using bombs. They were using drive nets, they, were, they were literally could come up to any, the front of any village and commercially fish and it was perfectly legal. What do you think the local people thought of that? Not much. That's why the, some of that decision making power was devolved out. And you, you, you'd be surprised though when it's your resources on your doorstep and it's a glo some global company wanting to take your fish and you've got the legal right to tell them to, you know what, go away. Most of the time they tell them to go away. Sean, comment on sharks? Um, well, I, I don't think the story is too much different than the way that uh, Gary put it for sharks. So um, I don't think I have anything to add. Yeah, I'd, I'd just like it to make a comment um, on that stuff. My name's Simon Fowler. I've been working in Melanesia. I'll talk tomorrow. Um, I've been working there for about the last 15 years. And um, I, I think these issues are really very difficult and they're very complex and they're, and they're very different in different places. So 
what's, what's a good answer in Philippines? It's not going to be a good answer in the Solomons. Um, you know, you've got different demographics, you've got very different cultures, um, and you need to really know a lot about the society um, and also about the markets. Ove is dead right. Um, the pressure on people to sell these lucrative commodities is irresistible. You know, they, they are ripping sharks out of Melanesia as we speak, and, and there's nothing very much we can do at a village level to stop that. Um, that there, there might be over a longer or medium to longer term with education, um, but there are things you can do at government level because a lot of these commodities go through one or a small number of points of sale. And if aid dollars can be directed at paying fisheries enforcement officers a decent salary, most of them get like, you know, a 40th or something of the salary that people in rich countries like Australia get. If they can get a decent salary, if they can get decent training, if there can be a better institutional setup developed as there has been to some extent with the National Fisheries Authority in Papua New Guinea, um, you can actually achieve something. But it's messy and it's going to take a while. There are, you have to attack these problems from multiple fronts. Thanks. I'll take that as a statement. There's a one, one there on the aisle. Yes. No, you can keep the... Uh, you're going to ask a question. Absolutely. Where you go. Um, I was just going to change... I didn't want to move the topic off developing countries because obviously that's really important, but... We're in Australia and it is a wealthy country and often people are very removed from their environment. So could you just give me some actions that the general public can actually take to help protect the environment so that you know, everyday people can actually think about what they can do? Switch off the lights. <laughs> Shock, horror, yes. Go on. What can we do? Well, I think in terms of global warming and revolutionizing the way we use energy, which we've got a sh very short window to do, we have to, uh, you know, there, there are small actions that everybody can take. And these are now quite well documented. And the government is, the present government and maybe the future government are getting serious about actions that we can take. Now, wh how you can trans... which is reducing our energy, individual energy imprints on the environment. How much you can translate that into looking after the sharks or the fish at an individual level, I don't know. David? I, I think your most immediate ability to take action is uh, going to come in a few weeks' time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I wonder what he means. <laughs> Sean. Yeah, I mean, t towards that end, I think a, a lot of it is just paying attention. Um, I, th I think in a lot of these cases, there's a small number of people who benefit from the status quo, and a, a large number of people often who um, would like to see a very different sort of course of events transpire. And uh, I think if decision makers are believe that there are a lot of eyes on them, then they might uh, be inclined to make... Uh, different decisions or make decisions instead of not making decisions. I mean, another point would be um, if you take uh, recreational fishing and, and sharks as bycatch, for example, I mean, one response, of, um, one response of fishers might be to deny there's a problem, but another response of fishers might be to say, oh, my God, there's a big problem with bycatch of sharks in the line fishery. If we want to have, if we want to continue to be able to go out and go fishing for coral trout, and have our children go out and fish for coral trout, we need to be very careful about uh, what we do when we catch sharks um, and ensure that we release them live, for example. So, um, so I think there are a, a lot of things that, that can be done just in terms of you know, these little bits and pieces. Can I, I probably shouldn't confess this in the Australian Academy of Sciences, but if you read this month's Women's Weekly, it... <laughs> It has a whole section on how individuals can reduce their carbon footprint. That's where it counts, yes, and in, that's in magazines about like that. Yeah. where it matters. Yeah. So. Can I also say that I'm vaguely associated with the uh, Sydney Aquarium, which has got the, uh, I think, uh, the, the accolade of being the top tourist attraction in the country commercially. 
And we said to them, where is your statement about the environment? And being business people, they said, what? <laughs> but we've turned them around and shown them how those millions of people who are going through can be made aware of these very things about marine science, about fish, about how they could be involved to make a difference, and also how the aquarium can fund research. Uh, look, just a quick comment about the... We've heard some great evidence tonight about the importance of robust you know, fish populations on reefs and the ecosystem spin-offs that that has. Quite often, though, when that gets into the political sphere and where a politician has to deliver a network of MPAs to the public, the thing they focus on most is the benefits for recreational fishing. And that tends to lead recreational fishers to tackle the argument that, well, if we can demonstrate that we can have increased fish populations without MPAs, the, the argument for MPAs evaporates. And, and that tends to have a lot of problems, I suppose, where there's good evidence in tropical areas for recovery of fish populations, but not in temperate. And that makes that argument very difficult in the political sphere. So I'd, I'd love to see more focus on the, the ecosystem spin-offs of a robust um, reef and the habitat benefits that, that no-take MPAs actually have. Final question, because we've got to leave in a minute. Who, ah, Roger. May I just say while I'm walking down here that um, <clears throat> what I also do as a member of the public is terrorise the supermarket. When I see Orange Ruffy on display, the poor person behind the counter gets a lecture on how old the fish is and how it's a total disgrace to be selling it and how I'm going to take action if I find it there ever again. Boy. <laughs> oh, sorry. Roger. <laughs> Thanks. We're probably, d despite all our best efforts uh, with trying to do things to reduce carbon dioxide within Australia, for example, but we've got to remember that Australia produces about 1% of the greenhouse gases in the world and we don't actually measure the total greenhouse gases with anything like that accuracy anyway. And given the lags in getting international agreements, remembering it took maybe 30 years to get world trade agreements it, and they're not solid, it took 30 years to get nuclear non-proliferation agreements, they're not solid and so on. And given the lags then of retrofitting and rebuilding the infrastructure that will produce um, fewer uh, carbon dioxide emissions, changing our power stations and so on, we're probably committed, we're, or we're more likely than not, committed to about 450 parts per million of carbon, of carbon dioxide by the middle of the century. What will reefs look like? At that, at that point by the middle of the century, at, the, at, the, at that sort of level of um, CO2, what will, what will they be like? I think the short answer is we really don't know at this stage. Um, it's hard to predict. As you've seen in these talks, the reef ecosystem is very complex. There's a lot of feedback loops. Well, and um, trying to predict what's going to happen at 450 versus or 750 is, is going to be difficult, I think. Well, I mean, I guess I would say a couple of things. Um, so Janice tells me that that's a couple of degrees increase in temperature. In the tropical oceans. Yeah. Um, and so some of the most susceptible species to bleaching are um, the same corals that provide the most habitat structure, branching corals like those in the genus Acropora. So, uh, you would expect um, growth rates and mortality rates and reproductive rates of um, those species to change um, most unfavorably. So I would expect to see some structural simplification of reefs, and um, at least in the medium term. And, uh, and there will probably be associated changes in the communities of fishes that rely on those structurally complex colonies. Um, I might be wrong those branching corals might adapt much faster than I imagine, but I would expect that sort of a change uh, to reef communities, at least potentially among other things. I'd like to add, it probably depends on what our actions are. If we take effective actions to try and help the reefs and sustain them, minimizing nutrient inputs, maximizing the number of herbivores, taking care in whatever way we can, we can influence that outcome. So the guaranteed thing is that there's going to be change what they're going to look like, to some extent, is dependent upon our actions. So we have choices. Uh, we've just got to make them soon. 
And Roger, as you think back, uh, how long it takes to do anything, if we regard this as the equivalent of war, I think Flory and the team got penicillin going in about four and a half years. Now it would take 25. I think they did more or less the same with radar and a few other technologies. If they really want to get their act together, boy, can they move fast. It's only when they get a kind of psychological enema <laughs> that it happens. <laughs> Maybe now is the time for it. We have to leave the Academy, the Shine Dome. Thank you very much to the Centre of Excellence and certainly to the panel. Thank you very much indeed for coming.